TheWellnessCouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. Welcome to Love Life, featuring your hosts, Rebecca Detman and Jane Donovan. The sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light. Welcome to Love Life. I'm Rebecca Detman. And I'm Jane Donovan. And we're talking today on the topic of white knights. Now, you may have heard of this, you may not have, but I think as we begin to describe it a bit further, you'll be nodding your head pretty quickly going, oh, yeah, 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 met one of them or am one of them or this topic interests me greatly. And I'll tell you why this topic probably does interest you greatly, because this topic could actually be loosely linked to the recent phenomenon of twilight. The reason being, for those of you that know Twilight because either you have read all four books like me because you just have to know what people are talking about or you got dragged to the cinema for one of the four franchises or <laughs> whatever it is. Jane's got teenage daughter, so you probably know all about <laughs> Yes, it's been on repeat here. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's one of those things that, yes, we all love to hate it. It's a bit like Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a whole other podcast show, right, Jane? <laughs> yes. We'll do that one another time. And But I think, you know, when these... When these books or themes or movies come out that really, for whatever reason, tap into the collective consciousness of the planet, and you can't deny it, everyone in the world practically knows, at least has heard of what this is. And I always am quite interested spiritually almost in the power of these sorts of things. I, I look at years ago, even things like Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and you know The Secret, or whenever these things come along out of seemingly absolutely nowhere, that for whatever reason, every second person on the planet is suddenly finds themselves talking about so I'm going a long way around here but to get back to Twilight Twilight raised some very interesting themes which have been debated you know even in universities by academics by feminists um, you know at every level there's been a lot of discussion about the themes in Twilight and are they healthy or are they not and of course the strongest theme in the book is this idea of a very I call it vanilla sort of wishy-washy type of bland female character who's got the feminist jumping up and down, absolutely hating her guts, uh, paired with a boy who he's positioned to look romantic in the sense that he's highly protective, watches her while she sleeps, hovers by her elbow, does everything or anything for her, but which has also been tipped into the category of controlling, possessive and dangerously overprotective. And this is a phenomenon that if you spend as much time on the internet as I do in teen websites, because teens are my biz, um, you do see that there, this pattern is being replicated unhealthily in junior relationships and, of course, as I'm sure Jane will tell you with what she sees, in adult relationships, in the sense that women often will tend to play the maiden, and men will want to play what we call the white knight. And that's all very well and good and is actually quite sexy and romantic in an alpha beta way and in a Hollywood way if you get it right. But once it goes past a certain boundary line, it gets needy, it gets codependent, and it gets very emotionally unhealthy. Do you know what I'm talking about, yeah, Jane? Yeah, absolutely, it does. And it is often, I think it is, you touched on alpha beta, and I think a lot of that comes into play here. And it is when somebody is spending too much time in one energy. Now, I truly believe that alpha and beta energy, alpha being masculine, controlling, uh, creative, beta being flowing, fluid, um, compassionate, just to really summarize it short, it's, much, it's actually worthy of its own podcast, this topic. However, in the short version, we are meant to be balanced. We are meant to swing between both. There are times that we are in alpha and there are times that we're in beta. And I think that through our whole lifetime, it is to come to grips and master being perfectly balanced between the two. But when one spends a huge amount of time in beta and the other spends a huge amount of time in alpha, it's not sustainable long term without it becoming toxic. Right. So this white knight phenomenon is a really interesting one because if you put it into Google, you'll find some really interesting stuff. And one thing you'll find is a lot of men out there, and these are particularly American websites because it's more of a term that's familiar to some in, in the States, but you'll find a lot of men get really, really defensive and rejecting of this term. They don't want this term to be seen to apply to them, which is interesting because it does use the word knight, 
And what man at a core, sort of almost primal level doesn't want to be the hero or the rescuer? I mean, that, there, there's definitely an archetype there, a universal human archetype where the man loves to go out and adventure and save and heal and help and, and you know, do all of that stuff that he's been gifted with, with his strength and his vision and his resourcefulness. Okay, but when we, when we put the tag white in front of it, and I'm certainly not talking about gender or, or class or race or anything like that, I'm talk, we're talking more about, it's almost like a softness they're, re, they're referring to. They talk they're talking about men who actually have the balance wrong and they're just rescuers. They're, they're either using it for ego because they want to be seen as the one who runs in and rescues women generally emotionally, although physically maybe if they can, um, but also uh, in terms of, um, oh, Jane, sorry, the emotional and in terms of their own uh, their own boundaries in themselves because clearly what's going on here is they've got a very deep need for validation or need me, want me, need me, needing it is very, very needy. So there's a desperateness that's reeking out of these men who, for whatever reason, can only be validated through playing a bit of a pretend role in life. I see this play out a lot in the dating game where the men actually become great friends. They really struggle from friendship to relationship. So they, they will go on a date and they will sit down and they're great listeners. They've got great advice. They're really validating the woman. They're making her feel very special. But they're doing it in a very passive, needy way that has people go, you make me feel good about me, but I don't know that I really want to, you know, I'm not feeling any chemistry here. There's no masculine chemistry. So it, it has become softer instead of it being more, Alpha. Is that making sense? I think you're going back into alpha beta here, which which is it is such a fascinating topic and we will devote an entire podcast to that very soon. So apologies if there's too much double up here. But it's a crucial conversation again that needs to be had at this point in our society, the alpha beta. Because what Jane is seeing and what I'm seeing in my own way is you know, and let's not blame feminism, because I'm all for feminism in a healthy dose, but women have almost become too strong or no that's the wrong way to put it women have become so strong that men have actually almost forgotten where they fit into this equation and women while we enjoy being strong by which i mean we've got our careers we can have our own money we can own our own property we can make our own choices which we haven't been able to do for let's face it most of recorded history so we're having this fantastic winning streak and we almost don't know ourselves all this power we've suddenly been dumped in our laps you know we don't even know what to do with it and men have all of a sudden gone onto the back foot and said, hang on a minute, what do I do? What's my role? What, what do I provide? Am I worthy? Do you even want me? What do you even need a man for? And they've got this deep-seated insecurity about it. And women who are too strong or who are living with all of this strength have no idea how to be vulnerable. This is a whole Fifty Shades of Grey conversation now. But yeah, but and that's what actually deep down many women are craving is how to go back to maiden and allow the man to be the knight in a beautiful, sexy, romantic that's way. That's absolutely right. Yes, yes. The, I think there's another thing. I'm not sure if I'm deviating here too, but there's another uh, thing that I see playing out also in fiction. It's funny if we're going back to mm. reverting to, to talking about novels. There's a series of books called The Black Brother daggerhood or something and they are vampires but these are the king of the vampires the most sexiest thing in these books which mind you they're very very hot but they're also very violent which i'm not into however the the common thread is that these vampires when they find their partner they mate for life and life for them is over a thousand years and they have eyes only for that woman and they bond and the protectiveness of anybody coming near that woman, it is so sexy and it is something that women are desiring. And this is why Twilight has been an international phenomenon amongst not only the teen girls and a smattering of boys. There are Twilight boy fans, they won't admit it, but you can find them if you Google. Um, and the Twilight moms, this whole, you know, book club sort of twi moms. Um, <laughs> so which is, you know, women like me, women in our early 30s who want the escapist fantasy of being looked after, being taken care of, being able to relax from all the duties and responsibilities that we have to carry and do in our multitasking, crazy 21st century everyday lives. And there is a massive part of femalehood that just says, I would love to sit down and have a man step forward and take care of things for me in a way, in a, in a beautiful, you know, it is that nurturing, loving, don't worry, darling, <laughs> you 
<laughs> protective kind of a way. Um, and so Twilight tapped massively into exactly the same storyline Jane's just mentioned when they talk about the werewolves imprinting, which was the same idea, is that if you're imprinted upon, you've got a life partner and you never leave their side and you're deeply protective of them. So you can see that this theme is, is running red hot right now in our common narrative, in our social discourse. It's a best-selling you know, narrative that's happening right now. So, Jane, why? What's going on in society that's making us crave these themes more than we ever have before? I think, okay, well, I think most of the readers of these books are women, so we're going to talk about women, all right? I think that, I feel that women have, they have got it all, and we are enjoying having fabulous careers, being great mums, beautiful partners, having, you know, all sorts of things going on in our life. It's can you have it all? Yes, sort of, in a particular way. And it is exhaustive. It is alpha energy, spending a lot of time in alpha energy, and that is exhaustive. And so the fantasy, and you said the word fantasy, it is a fantasy. It is something that we would like to have in our lives for a short period of time. I do not believe that anybody wants this permanent. Well, the majority of people want it permanent. Yes. And that's what's important. So when you have this role model of this fantasy, whether it's in a book or a movie or wherever you've seen it, you can look at how can I have some of this play out in my life part of the time. Mm. And that is about understanding these different energy roles. And maybe it's about having the conversations with your partners about, you know what, I'm done with making decisions for this weekend or I want to go on holidays and I don't want to make a single decision I want everything taken care of mm -hmm. and you do it for a holiday period and then you come back and you go back into your alpha beta mm -hmm. but the other thing that can happen too is that for many people they've really disconnected from their beta energy and I truly think that's one of the most powerful gorgeous dynamic energies that you can be in so maybe by trying to spend short amounts of time in that energy yourself you may find that the fantasy or the, the seeking of this fantasy into reality dissipates because you are actually now giving yourself this gentleness and this fluidity and this time off. Mm. Interesting, interesting. Because I'm just going back to the white knight thing again. See, I guess when you're talking about, Jane, the fact that this kind of behaviour isn't necessarily healthy in a huge way or sustainable for decades necessarily i mean in terms of it's okay to have healthy pockets of it and to and to work out the right balance of it but too much of a good thing leads us again into that needy or desperate or a little bit unbalanced type of behavior and that again is where i see this white knight syndrome coming in where there are a lot of very codependent relationships out there and this goes back to your mantra jane about you, you can only ever be responsible for your own happiness so partners who match up because one of them's got emotional weaknesses or vulnerabilities and has the, the prototype or the archetype where they love to be rescued because they need the attention. And the other partner wants to be the hero and gets validated through rescuing or protecting uh, emotionally or physically. And when these two types of souls come together, it again, it's like magnets. They actually fit and they click and they work for quite a while. But there's problems at the core. There is. Now, one of the problems that does occur on this too is that the, the needy person is actually going to create drama. Now, we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago about drama. Uh, do you bring drama into your life? Now, if you have partnered up with a rescuer, you will continue to create drama so that, that can, you can be rescued because this is your toxic idea of love. <laughs> yes, and you're going to fulfill each other's roles beautifully. And again, this might go along quite well for quite a few years. You know, you could keep topping up each other's perceived love tanks in this way, rescuer and rescue me and rescuee and rescuer, I guess it is. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, I know, Jen, I've seen, have you seen this in couples? I've, I've got friends well, like this. I actually, one of the worst examples examples I saw was of a wonderful woman who did it to all of her adult children. I could not believe the drama of this one family. Like if you wrote the movie, Hollywood would reject it as a ridiculous movie. And this is true life. And it was absolutely their love language. It was, I'm in trouble. Mum's going to come and rescue. Mum was searching out the rescue or was searching out the drama mm -hmm. to fix and be validated and needed. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, you know, but, but again, if they're all happy with it, you know, mm. I'm a big fan of if you're happy with it, mm. it's not broken, don't fix it. Mm. So I'm not saying you have to fix this. However, if this is something that's happening in your life and you're actually finding that it is becoming toxic, that you are starting to stand up on your own two feet and you are feeling greater independence, then this can be helped to identify 
what's going on. And it's about the conversations, having the language, talking to your partner about, you know, I love that you come to my rescue all the time. However, this time I have got a challenge, but I want to really try and face this myself. I don't mind whizzing it past you for your opinion and your wisdom to help me know how to resolve this, but I really want to face the music and do it myself. I want to grow up. Absolutely, because what is actually happening here is a stunted relationship where neither individual is actually personally developing or, you know, soul evolution. There's no real growth going on here. So the guy that's rushing, I'm saying guy. I mean, this could probably be the other way around, and I'm sure it, this exists. Well, as I said, it was a mother that was, this the, was a mother. The, the rescuer. Yeah. The rescuer, shall we just say. The rescuer is not doing enough work on themselves. They're constantly needing to be validated by feeling like they did a good job for somebody else, okay? But can they do a good job for themselves? Do they know what that looks like? Do they, do they know what that feels like? To be able to give themselves their own, almost like a report card on how I did today or how did I think I did on something without needing to hear, oh, what would I do without you from somebody else? And as for the person who's being rescued, well, oh, childhood, isn't it? It's always this, I'm just... I'm, I mean, it's not even like we're looking at an actual person here, but the minute I start talking about this, it's like in my head I see a girl with daddy issues or somebody who's like, love me, need me, I need attention. It's it's the the people that learn the patterns, like Jane said, that the more drama they create, the more attention they get, and that's their their method of feeling or experiencing love. So. We've got some deeper core self-love issues at work there. So the person who's always looking to be rescued needs to rescue themselves. They've got to learn how to stand on their own two feet and have a lot more confidence in life, learn how to make their own decisions and really, you know, find a place of... Um, it's, it's personal power. It's, it's retapping back into your personal power, your confidence and your quiet self-belief. It's also independence, dependence, codependence, intradependence and we want to aim to get to that last one where we are we are independent and yet we depend on each other mm. it's a more it's a not toxic relationship you know it's interesting that when one partner does one person and it's often the person who has been rescued decides to grow in independence they will often find that the rescuer starts to undermine your ability of self worth so if they can no longer be rescuing and you're starting to be independent in your your way of living it is likely that the rescuer is going to start to say things to you like I don't think that's a good decision and I don't actually think you can pull that off I don't think that you're worthy of that I don't think you know what you're doing and they're going to start to self-sabotage your belief in yourself so also look for that as you start to grow as an independent person it is very common for people to not want to see you grow, they don't want to see you change, and they will sometimes project some pretty negative stuff at you to undermine your sense of self-worth. Of course, because what we see a lot, and Jane and I have talked about before, is once you start to change, really dramatically change your inner game, the people around you will either stay with you for the journey and, and bounce off you, ricochet off your energy like a ripple effect and go with you, they'll have to change too, and then it's fine, or they'll drop away. And so in some of these de dependent, very codependent type white knight rescuer relationships, definitely if one partner changes, the other probably will not be feeling like their needs are met and they may well drop away. And it, I think it's also quite valid for if you are listening to this and you feel like you are in a little bit of an emotional sort of dynamic like this, you may well be saying, but what does it really look like if, if I'm a strong, confident, independent woman and I can handle my own problems and, and my husband or my partner or whoever um, is also that way, how is that sexy or how, how what sort of love does that actually look like? Because these people may not have ever had role modelling of what that sort of relationship looks like. Jane, what does it look like? Um, blah, blah. <laughs> what are we aiming for? What are we aiming for in... What, let's put it this way, Jane. If, if people sit down in front of you, and this could be any client, what sort of a relationship do you help people try and arrive at that you see as being the healthiest, the most balanced energies in a couple? What are we aiming for? Do you for? know why I stumbled over answering that question? was because I don't. I don't project what my belief of the perfect relationship is. Because there's no one truth. There is no one truth. Right. And they have to go through their journey. And I, my role is to respect that, mm. get out of the way of my thinking of what's, what's good and what's bad. What I do is I stop people from having Groundhog Day. I don't want them to keep repeating what they've been doing because there's no growth in that. There's no happiness. There's no new tomorrow. So my role would be more about if you've had this type of relationship, then perhaps you could look for some different things. So it's about, in this case, getting down to your core values of what is it that you desire 
in another person? What is going to make you happy? And it's usually about how does that make you feel? So it's not the car, the money, the, the house, the career, the looks. It's not that. It is more about deeper values of, of you know, do you want somebody that's kind? And we've talked about this, I know, yeah. before. And, it, and, and how are you going to identify that? And then go after that. So instead of going after the white knight, you know, the white knight can often end up being quite narcissistic as well. That's, that's you know, if they come in very controlling, very much in alpha energy, and here's this very strong independent woman that's dating this guy for the first time and swept off her feet because he's picked her up in a gorgeous car and he's taken her to this fabulous restaurant and he's taking charge of everything and she's going, oh, this feels amazing. I feel like a woman. I feel feminine. I feel taken care of. This guy's incredible. He's big energy. And it keeps going and keeps going, but there's actually very little emotional connection. Mm -hmm. It's quite narcissistic. It's quite surface. So that can be another another shadow side of this type of energy. And again, how long can a relationship like that really be sustained? Because there's actually a lot of hollowness at the core there. You're playing roles and they work on the surface, but get down deeper and where you're going to go from there. And this might sound like we're really stating the obvious here, but you cannot rely on anybody else for your happiness. So if you're getting your hit, your emotional hit, from every time your partner says, oh, do you need something, darling? Or how can I help you? Or I'll be there for you. Or I'll come pick you up or whatever it is. I mean, come on. If that person gets, let's be horrible here. If that person gets hit by a bus tomorrow, what have you learned? What have you learned about building up your own strength of self? What have you learned about how to feel confident and happy and resourceful and secure in any situation that life might throw at you? You cannot live outside of yourself. You cannot let somebody else's mood dictate you know, the energy of the day. You cannot let somebody else's perceived lack of or, or topping up of love be you know all that you need to get on with your day it doesn't start there no it doesn't and it's interesting that if you choose to reject the opportunity that life gives us for self-growth it's going to be forced on you anyway you know a beautiful friend of mine in a very very happy relationship uh, her husband did something rather naughty and ended up in jail and that was a Are we allowed to know what, Jane? No, because it's so unique and it was the front page of the paper all around Australia that it would identify that person oh, instantly. I know. I know. Teaser. All right. right. Well, it's not actually about that. If the story I'm doing is it's about the drama of some one day she is living this incredible life and there's a knock on the door and her husband's in jail and he's never been out since. And she was, of course, gutted. And, you know, I, I'm happy to say that I was able to support her through this. Very quickly, we identified that the greatest lesson that she was going to get from this was independence. Mm. She was so dependent on him. Mm. And there was, you know, at that point, there was nothing wrong with it. She loved it. She loved this role. He was playing the white knight. I'm not sure she actually needed rescuing, but she was enjoying she was enjoying the break from the hard work, I think, in life. And so this was then forced upon her. Now, I think it's been about two and a half years that he's been in jail for now. And she is so happy. She's in such a good place. Misses him dreadfully and looks forward to the day he's back home. However, she is really grasping and enjoying the independence of her life, the, the everyday things that she's been forced to stand up and do to make it money to, um, because part of him going to jail was all the assets, everything got, the, everything was taken, home, car, the lot. So it was about financial independence. It was about being able to pay the bills, being able to manage a house by herself, being able to manage being a single mother, everything. And she's doing so well. But the universe is going to deliver it to you with either a feather, a brick, or a sledgehammer. You're going to get it. You're going to get your opportunities to grow. Now, I prefer to have my messages come in a feather form. So I choose to be very sensitive and open to what is it that I am to learn, experience, enjoy, grow. If I choose to ignore the messages, the signs, then I'm going to get the brick, which I actually recently had a brick. But thank goodness I got the brick because I really don't want the sledgehammer. Every now and then a brick is okay. I see clients who their whole – it actually seems like the way that their soul chooses to learn in the universe is just by repeatedly hitting their head against brick walls is the way I phrase it. And they – because some – it sounds a bit rough, but you've got to remember that at a high level we always put up our hands for everything in terms of our own soul growth in the bigger picture. And there genuinely are souls out there who – 
they kind of need to work, work, sorry, learn the hard way because the subtle approach doesn't work for everyone. And yeah, hey, I'm feathers too, Jane. It's all feathers here. <laughs> Only feathers, please. But yeah, no, I definitely see people who have their biggest aha moments and their biggest wake up calls when they've really, really had to, get, you know, fall down and stand up many, many times, often quite dramatically. And that's what finally drives the message home in a spectacular and powerful way. And if you are somebody who rescues, Please understand that by continually rescuing somebody, you're stopping them from growth. You really are. You can't hold your hand up forever. You have to take your hand away at some point. Mm. And I was only uh, recently talking to a friend yesterday about this very thing that he had been supporting a friend and he was devastated because it had, they'd had a big fight. And I said, well, you can't keep holding them up. You can't keep hearing the same victim story and supporting that you're enabling it yeah you, know, you don't want to be an enabler you want to be a supporter from love so the words instead of you know listening to the same old victim story all the time instead could be how is it that i can help you what can we can i do to help you to change this story because it's almost again it's like when i talk about that little emotional hit you get off it like how much does he care about me or what will it, how far will he go for me and there's also a bit of a self esteem hit there isn't there for the rescuer like you know that again it's that that feeling wanted and, and feeling validated um I want to do segue, and I do want to segue a little bit into, into Fifty Shades of Grey because I do think it is so incredibly bang on exactly what we're talking about. There has been so much discourse and so much analysis of those three incredibly badly written books, all of which I read and actually quite enjoyed, let's just say. Oh, good, because I was going to say, I love yes, them. Yes, that's right. I did so many radio shows on those books. And, it was yeah, everywhere. And similar to, to the Twilight phenomenon, there's so many different lines of discourse, interpretation and argument that, have, that the themes that, that those those books have brought up but the main theme that I took away from it and I know that Jane's probably going to resonate on the same I mean, and there's lots of themes but the one I'm going to go with right now is the character of Christian Grey for those of you who haven't read it who's basically into his little S&M and his dominatrix and his whatever sort of games okay and takes a very young and very innocent young girl under his care and protection falls in love with her showers her with money and gifts and protection and complete emotional availability at all times I'm always there for you I'm always here and while the books probably handle it in a way that is is too over the top it's slightly I mean it's unbelievable he's like what a 20 something year old billionaire whatever but I'm hot as <laughs> we did use the word fantasy 15 minutes ago yeah of course he's hot and he's got the rippling abs and all of this is going on right yeah but you know in the act of the sex games, you know, bondage, that so he's tying her up, she's got to do go back into a real place of vulnerability, a place of trust, a place of exposing herself, opening herself up to him and letting him take charge, take control. And it just tapped right in to something that all of those hot and bothered and stressed housewives or, you know, career ladies or whoever, we're, we're back to this theme, this central theme, Jane, about just sometimes in life learning how to get to a place where we don't have to be on all the time we don't have to be the one running the show all the time because that can be exhausting for the person that's got to always carry the load absolutely totally exhausting which is the beta energy it is letting things flow soft kind gentle loving giving fluid floating in the flow and i think that sometimes that beta energy actually comes into play when we are in our greatest moments of happiness and you could even be doing an alpha activity but you just get that connection of i'm in the flow I'm connecting. I'm right here in this moment right now. Because what I'm identifying through actually this talk is really making this clear for me, Jane, is that women are seeming to go into two categories. They either go into the maidenhood category so strongly. It's the victim. It's the help me, rescue me, save me. I'm too weak. I've got a girlfriend who can't, won't even open a jar in the house. She's like her husband has to open all the jars for her. I'm like, buy one of those gadgets that does it for you. <laughs> that is pathetic. Anyway, but, you know, they both get their little hit off that. He feels wanted, she, you know, blah, blah. But then we've got the other category, which is the women who have had to be strong for so long that they have no idea how to take a few steps back from that somewhere into the middle, back into those That's right. of vulnerability. Look, I think it's healthy. With our alpha beta energy, I try to swing between it several times every day. You're a swinger. I am a swinger. How's that? <laughs> Fabulous. But if we swing between the energies, we become more balanced. Yes. Instead of living 95% of our life in one or the other. And I just want to summarize too, if I can, on the uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, is that there is also two lovely things... Uh, uh, I saw in this 
particularly because it was about two single people meeting, was that she actually did have good boundaries in place. She didn't just grab his initial contract of here's what I expect from you. She negotiated it. She showed very firm boundaries while standing in the face of a fantasy, mm. which is really ballsy and courageous. She knew what she wanted. She knew her boundaries. She was going for it. Great self-worth. The second thing was that the books over the three series actually showed that when there is love there, there is the incentive to do the work to heal your past, which is what he did. He did start going and, and seeking therapist's uh, help to try and heal why he was the way he was. Yeah, but and this could be another podcast now that we're leading into, but is there not also then an archetype there, Jane, which we have to be very careful of as well, which is the – it's like the bad boy and the girl who believes she can change him or rescue the little boy in him. And a lot of the time that doesn't play out for real in real life, does it? Or it does? Oh, you had to yes. say it does? I mean, yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, people are doing that, but it doesn't work is what I'm saying. Oh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work. work. No, no, no. Yeah. But, it's, but it's, that's actually, we will do a whole podcast on that because that also gets into the energy of the groupie, of the sports groupie, of the girls, of the behavior. And, you know, that's so my field. I've worked for 23 years specializing in sports entertainment. I've seen it all in mm. that arena. Yeah. So that would be a great one for another day. Well, Absolutely. You're just going to have to keep listening to us, people. I hope you've enjoyed this session. This is Love Life with Rebecca Detman. And I'm Jane Donovan. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week for a fantastic show we've got lined up on Affairs in Marriage. And if you've got anything that you'd like to share with us, any topics that you'd like us to talk about, please look for our Facebook page, Love Hy uh, sorry, Love Hyphen Life. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Hi, Damien Christoph from The Wellness Guys here. Wow, it's been electric since our first summit came to a close up on the Gold Coast. And the wellness community wants more. Well, get ready because our next summit is coming to Melbourne and we'd love to have you come. The Wellness Guys will be there plus effervescent up for a chat girl, Cindy O'Meara, Kim Morrison and Karen Smith and some super...